Hello. We are back. Hello. Yeah. So during the break, we were thinking that like hopefully everything uh, appears simple uh, for you. Like we were thinking that like, is this simple or is it not? Is this complicated or is it not? We don't know. Uh, so so if you um, like at, at the end, remember to put the feedback on, like so that we know that was, was everything clear. Yeah. Uh, and do remember to put stuff in the notes as well, so that we know uh, where you what's what's happening. But, yeah. Uh, so so, Richard, what do we have for us uh, at this last like lightning round of of talks? Yeah. So there's or as you see from the schedule, there's four things you want to cover: application, software modules, data storage, remote access to data. Each of these is itself. Well, not a very long page, but a bit involved. But behind the scenes, there is so much um, going on there. So our goal is to give you the summary of why it's important, but you can read it and ask questions on your own time. And that's better than what we've done before when we spent hours on all of these and everyone yeah. just gets bored. Um, yeah. We'll try to like basically provide you with the cliff notes of, of what is uh, what yeah. is yeah uh, what what you should be like basically public service of announcement or this yeah. kind of like at this point probably everybody is a bit uh, already yeah. like there's so much happening already in the course so we try to like keep it as mm -hmm. like simple as possible so yeah. let's talk about applications what are applications yeah. Richard I mean I guess whenever anyone wants to run something on the cluster you want to run some software. And it might be something that you've created completely by yourself, but often it's something that is automatically installed. And for this, um, what does it mean? Yeah, so, well, yeah. Yeah, go right And on. so, yeah, you log in and you want some software, like you want Python, which appears to be here, or you might want R, or you might want MATLAB or any number of more specialized things. So if you go to the random page of some random application and ask, how do I install it? That will probably not work on the cluster itself because you don't have admin access there, but there are other things you can do. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so first of all, I would say that like, like Richard said, like, like the the system is shared, so you you like, you you cannot get ad admin access there. But of course, like in many cases, the cluster administrators try to install something that will benefit the whole community. So there already exists usually like software that has been installed. Uh, we'll talk about how these pre-installed software we we use this module system to to load these. Mm -hmm. uh, how these can be like loaded, but yeah, th this is one yeah. option. Yeah. Um, can you ever install things by yourself? Yeah, I, I would say, like most of the time, yes. Like, but but uh, for many programs, especially on Linux, that the computers like these cluster computers usually run. Mm -hmm. You either need to like compile it, or you need to get it pre-compiled somewhere else. Like mm -hmm. somebody already has done the dirty work for you, right? Yeah. And and if you take it from somewhere else, like there are various things you can use. Like we use Conda nowadays a lot to provide various mm -hmm. kinds of softwares. You can use these Aptainer or Singularity containers to to install like libraries. And if your code doesn't require yeah to compile its own libraries. It's like interpreted code, like MATLAB code or R mm -hmm. code or Python code. In many cases, you can use yeah. like the already existing software modules that we provide. Yeah. Um, so when someone comes and needs to use something, I guess this page will give the general summary. But first you mm -hmm. look and see, is it already there? And then you would decide, do you ask us or do you try to install yourself? 
and it depends on how um, good you are at adapting installation instructions. Mm. There's also this and thing called containers. Yeah, I already mentioned it in in like passing. So there are these containers, this obtainer or singularity containers that can make you so that you can run. So that if you are familiar with Docker containers, they're a bit similar but a bit different. Uh, if you're interested, there was we were having this work like this workflows course for mm -hmm. uh, high performance computing, and I gave like an like a tutorial on these there the recordings should be in the code refinery uh yeah youtube page uh, and the course page is linked in that course as well we can link it into the chat yeah. as well so mm -hmm. those can be used to install basically if your program only runs on ubuntu let's say you yeah. can install it in a container and run that mm -hmm. container in the cluster yeah okay um should we go on so yeah. the next up is modules. And yeah. so module is one of the things that allows you to uh, load software. So you'll often see in order to use Python or R, whatever, run the command module load something. So for example, we could like, let's say we have some MATLAB users already com commented there in the in the notes so if we if you want to use matlab we have matlab installations usually and what we most of the computing clusters we all use this ala mod moduling module system and we in these there's this command called module spider that you can use to to check what mm -hmm. versions are, are installed for example matlab you can yeah try to search with the usual like terms, for example, module spider R or something. And there's yeah. like a okay. R so there's a lot version yeah. there. And let's say we if we want to use that, we would load that module. So let's say we load that R module. And now we can use command like which yeah. to check which R we have. And we notice that it it comes from somewhere a magical place where it suddenly yeah. found an R. Us. Yeah. So and we, there's a there's that... a big list of these usually uh, by by the uh, so the module purge cleans up the mo yeah. modules. There's all of the commands are documented in the page yeah. if you want to read it. Yeah. But uh, so there's usually like a whole bunch of this software that is available mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. computing clusters. Yeah. So if you're if you're looking for something, you might find it already here. Uh, yeah. if you, if you yeah. like, uh, yeah. So it, it the first yeah. one place to look at it would be over here. Yeah. And there is quite, uh, well, you need to know a little bit about module for almost anything you do. So I'd encourage you to read this page. Yeah. What the modules basically do like in, like in one sentence, they change various parts in the Linux terminal so that it finds diff like when you look for a program, it will find the program in different places. And we yeah. use this, instead of installing everything at the same time, we use this so that we can have multiple different software that might not compa be compatible with each other. So mm -hmm. let's say multiple versions of R or multiple versions of Python or something like that. Yeah. OK, should we go on to yeah. data storage? And now data storage is a very big thing and complex. I mean, the storage without data, <coughs> the cluster without data, um, what's the point? Yeah. And, <coughs> and for the cluster, it's not near as simple as add some hard drives there because the cluster has, the storage has to be big. So ours is five petabytes. It has to be accessible to hundreds of compute nodes and possibly thousands of jobs at the same time, all of which are reading and writing. So, yeah, so you can basically think of it as like a big pile of disks uh, <laughs> that has some magic uh, that makes it so that it appears as a one one computer, yeah. a one one uh, file system. 
So it's one big file system and everybody has their own files on that system. And there are usually these, like you, you can look at the documentation for the places where you should put stuff. But in our site, uh, for, in Alta, for example, you basically always want to work on the scratch file system, which is the uh, work directory where like the big file system that we have. We also have this uh, bit of a legacy home uh, home folder that is is much smaller and it's um, it's not meant for like high performance computing. So the other part is is uh, meant to store your actual data. Uh, the important things would be to note that like usually these file systems have a quota. So by default, the home folder has a 10 gigabyte quota and the scratch file system has a 200 gigabyte quota, like a personal quota. But then we also provide uh, bigger quotas for, especially for projects. So if you belong to like a research yeah. project, we can create a shared folder for your project and they, they can run to terabytes and yeah and and more the quotas so so how much files can you store and if you run out of file yeah. storage then ask us and we can increase it yeah to me the most important lesson here is that there's different types of storage for different purposes so our big scratch storage is well it's called scratch for a reason it's not backed up but it's big mm. alto has other places for example this hidden out alto network drives here which are not as a uh, higher or oh, yeah so, or yeah well, well, can, actually yeah let's yeah. come here this is good so for example alto has network drives that are not as big but they're very backed up they're backed yes, up sorry. they have snapshots they oh. have all kinds of um yeah sorry i um, yeah was sent to wrong place there. yeah it's yeah. sort of grayed out there yeah um, yeah oh so, yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, My bad. So, so whenever you have a bunch of data, you might need to um, put it in different places. For example, if you're collecting some original data, you would first put it on the project auto storage where it's backed up and then make a copy to Triton where it's not backed up but available to everywhere. And same for other like, things. There's like some of the compute nodes have really fast local disks, which are good for some things and so on. Yeah. Like usually, like you <laughs> want to think about like, what is your overall workflow? That usually you have something that is important, like the starting point of your thing. You you want that to be backed up in a project folder in the Alt Alta network drive. Yeah. And then you want to create a copy of that usually into the work directory or into the cluster so that you can work on that and and like in the fast fast file system and then yeah. your code might be in a version control system like you might want to put your code into the git version control mm -hmm. so that you you can modify it there and you can keep a better check of that yeah. and then like uh you you might need to navigate some of these different file file systems, but it's it's uh, it's not as yeah. complicated as it might look initially. Because once you get yeah. once you figure out your own workflow, it's usually um, quite easy to then manage afterwards. Yeah, there's a good comment. Can we? Okay, there was just an explosion mm. or boom outside. Um, okay. More like something falling. OK, so someone asked to mention separate quotas for number of files and size. So this is a good point. So on your own computer, yeah. you usually think the size is what matters, because your hard disk is a certain like number of terabytes. But on a cluster, the number of files is also quite important. And you can have a separate quota for both of these. Yes. So if I run quota command, for example, in 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 our cluster, you notice yeah. that I have, uh, well, quite a bit of files. Uh, so <laughs> you you can see here that there's these quotas over here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's read that. This. Yeah. Let's I'll make okay. it a bit. Yeah. yeah. So under group quotas, we see space. Yeah. 
quota limit files quota limit. Yes. So so the space is the actual space that I'm using. So currently, because I need to do lots of like tests and developments, I have a, like I need to have a big mm -hmm. bit bigger quota than than normally. So yeah. my quota is like three terabytes, and and I have two terabytes of of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, of data, and yeah. then my file quota is uh, is three million files and i'm almost hitting that and i'm pretty certain <laughs> that like 50 percent of that is like different kinds of like conda environment <laughs> installations yeah so many of the installations might create huge amounts of uh yeah. files and this this can get problematic in many clusters so many clusters mm -hmm. might have different uh documentations on how you should like mitigate problems by having too many files and that sort of stuff yeah. our file system uh, like luckily uh, it's designed yeah. to pretty much handle it quite well but the quota can still yeah. get quite full at some point so in those cases i would like i personally need, just need to do a cleanup at some point yeah. but uh yeah this um you might be you you should be mindful or know about that there's a difference there there's a there's number of files and then there's the uh like the actual size of those files and both are tracked by the quota yeah. okay um should we go to the can, remote can you, access can then? you scroll oh. down and show the available data storage options oh yeah so hopefully sure. your cluster has a table that looks something like this and will show the different places that are available and all the different properties. And it's worth looking at this and seeing what fits, but we don't need to yeah. go into details now. Yeah. We also okay. have a, another page for, for all the provided and it's like double the size <laughs> because there's so yeah. many places. So. You can put your data. If yeah. if you're unsure where should you put your data, just come and ask us. That's the yeah. easiest way. Yes, I agree. Um, and we enjoy answering these questions because it saves others a lot of time and is quite yeah. useful. So remote access. So you somehow need to copy data from wherever you're working to the cluster, unless you edit and write everything directly on there. But most people need to do this. And let's be honest, the copying of data, if you don't use the command line, it can be a little bit tricky and complex. But luckily, we have lots of different ways to do that now. So mm -hmm. it's getting better. There's two main different options here. One is remote mounts of data. So mounting means Let's see, where does it come from? Like you take a hard drive um, and, okay, here we go. So and basically- you take it and you mount the disk into somewhere and then it becomes available on that computer. And in this case, because we are mounting it through the network, what it means that the file is actually in the file system in, in Triton or in your cluster. But you are basically, you have the shadow of it in, in your uh, computer. And whenever you request, okay, like, can I have that file? It will have to transfer it through the network. And then if you do a modification, it will have to transfer the uh, mm -hmm. yeah. file back there. So for example, what we talked earlier about VS Code uh, yesterday, uh, VS Code basically, it's running on Triton. If you edit the file on your uh, on your uh, VS Code editor, it will have to send the modifications back to Triton because it's editing the actual file in in the cluster. Yeah. So that's basically yeah. how it works. Yeah. And this is really convenient because as files are being made in some directory, you immediately see it on your own computer. But for opening big files and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you need to transfer the whole file in order to like get access to it. Yeah. So the second picture is this transferring data. And this is what it looks like. So there's one copy somewhere and you make another copy somewhere else. And there's a lot of different tools that help you with this. Hmm. Um, yeah, the, the 
benefit of this is that once you then start processing the file at your own computer, let's say the results of your simulation or something, you now have it locally, so it's much faster to to work on that usually. Uh, but but the problem might be that now you have two copies, and how do you make certain that they are actually in sync, or if especially if you do modifications or that kind of stuff. There are tools that make transferring these files, like syncing these even large files, very useful, like Git Annex and and Data Lad and various other tools that you can use to do this. Uh, yeah. But but like you need to figure out a workflow that suits your specific use yeah. case usually. But but yeah, like yeah. if you ever encounter the situation where you're like, okay, I have a file underscore date underscore back or something like that <laughs> in your folder mm -hmm. that everybody has at some point, uh, then you know that okay, yeah. you could probably come and talk to us and we'll figure out a better tool for you yeah. to do the copying. Yeah. Okay. And for general purposes, I see many people using the mounting these days for lightweight use and then copying for bigger data. 